and I can say hello to everyone that's, um, that's joined us. So yeah, this is the second Zoom in three Zooms. It, it started like a small idea uh, of why don't we all connect to say what's been happening since March in different countries. And once I started contacting people, um, it just became out of hand. So um, we had a Zoom last week with 17 speakers from 14 countries. Um, and uh, they all gave us what's happening in, in their country since March. And this is the second one now. Um, uh, it's, it starts uh, with the first session, which is like a five minute uh, speed dating lightning talks uh, introductions of, from the speakers of what is going on um, in the country they're in or how they've experienced it traveling, for example. Um, and then we're going to open up, hopefully at 4.30, uh, do a discussion and uh, a Q&A. So if everybody's okay, we can start with Estonia. An amazing designer, Lilia, is there to tell us from the forest of Estonia. Uh, uh, thank you, Mayo. A forest is, of course, amazing also. All, it's also very grim at the moment. It's November. But to tell you um, more about Estonia, uh, I don't know. I, I need to explain that uh, for Estonians, so the theatre going uh, is almost a basic new thing. Uh, secondly, uh, I think uh, that uh, we have too much theatre here. <coughs> so, uh, we have these uh, repertory theatres which are 50% uh, uh, state-supported and then we have smaller and private theatres which uh, also uh, qualify for support and they all receive um, special help from uh, the government uh, in order to keep uh, the working places. Uh, and, uh, and the permanent company of actors and other people. It's like a big machine. Uh, and also we have these um, new performance groups uh, uh, and there is an unknown number of these. I don't know if, the, if they got uh, any help at all. And of course the individual freelance uh, artists uh, suffered most uh, during the lockdown, but they were allowed to apply um, through the um, professional unions uh, for a small stipend that covered the minimum of expenses uh, so that they continue uh, uh, had uh, opportunity to continue uh, to be active. Uh, of course not everyone got uh, uh, help because uh, the resources are limited. So there were many interesting uh, projects uh, developed during the lockdown because on the other hand, this was a precious time to, to rethink uh, things and, and develop new ideas. For example, there was a new, um, there is a, a group that is developing, it's not necessarily my kind of theater, but they're developing uh, um, uh, a new platform uh, for interactive digital theatre. You know, it, I find it interesting, but uh, I, of course, uh, I'm an old school designer and I, uh, an, a theatre person. I, I love the old, uh, old theatre. You know, forgive me, but, but I still want to mention it because it's, uh, it's kind of, it's all moving online and. And, and, and especially young theatre makers are, are really inspired and it was literally inspired by Corona. Uh, then in June, uh, the first outdoor uh, performance um, <clears throat> was opened uh, with a limited number of spectators who were uh, separated from each other. Uh, and uh, an international festival took place Actually, it's interesting to say that the first outdoor performance was actually di directed by uh, a, a scenographer, a designer, and it was the Jean Cocteau's The Human Voice, 
which is symbolic because uh, there is one character who is trying to connect and uh, she was put in a glass sealed box and was therefore also separated from, from the rest of the world. <clears throat> so a very interesting project and so on. Uh, but now as we come uh, to the second wave, um, uh, of course, uh, the rules uh, have become more liberal now because uh, the su in summer we all lost uh, the sense of uh, threat or, uh, you know, uh, it was wonderful. Um, but uh, we still have two plus two and two plus ten uh, restrictions for public ga gatherings and people are asked to wear masks but it's not uh, it's not the obligation yet so not all people exercise it so the theater managers have negotiated to um, the right to avoid uh, the 50 percent restrictions in the auditoriums uh, uh, arguing that uh, while uh, in the public places like uh, nightclubs and bars uh, and the like people shout, scream and sneeze into each other's face, then the theatre um, uh, spectators are seated in a fixed position neatly, uh, observing quietly and uh, that's not uh, uh, creating any serious threat. <clears throat> so um, although uh, the theatres are uh, allowed to accommodate uh, a full house, the bigger houses are not necessarily full either and the smaller venues struggle uh, to follow um, the proximity rules in the foyers uh, during the intervals because there is literally um, not enough space. It is per perhaps interesting uh, <laughs> to know that Estonians are almost painfully aware of their individual space otherwise. Um, so uh, currently all the uh, theatres are open and operating with the virus um, affecting some company members, uh, then the performances uh, are stopped for some weeks. The theatre I'm currently working uh, asked me not to uh, uh, visit the workshops until the further notice, but that doesn't mean that the uh, theatre is entirely closed because they have different venues and the performances continue. Some uh, theatres deploy grotesque measures to avoid infection. Our daughter, who is uh, an actress in a big repertory company, uh, has recently received instructions from the Human Resources Office uh, advising how to behave while acting on stage, um, uh, meaning that uh, uh, one has to direct the speech away from the partner. Uh, 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 they have to spend minimum time in the makeup room uh, and then pop uh, into street whenever uh, not on stage. So um, I, th I consider it quite drastic. I understand why these regulations are are introduced, but uh, it actually develops a, a completely new kind of acting. Um, so um, since spring, um, all the public uh, uh, places, including theatres and cinemas, have um, become exceptionally clean, almost cleansed. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily, uh, they were necessarily uh, dirty before, um, but uh, there is this uh, dread of infection, but also this um, desire uh, to somehow take control over the chaotic bodies, um, uh, and this is becoming more and more visible everywhere. And um, to draw it together, I, it must be uh, actually strange to look uh, into the auditorium from the stage and to see the masked uh, spectators uh, like some characters in a, in a weird play uh, and the masks that control uh, the spectators 
they ultimately separate them, uh, them from themselves. Uh, and to expand it to a wider context of pandemic, uh, at the moment we, are, uh, we have all become characters in some uh, uh, strange performance directed by a, a, an invisible director. Um, so, um, at last, I, I, I must say that uh, while 50% uh, of, uh, of uh, design work is solitary and I am fine with uh, uh, staying in the Corona capsule for a bit longer and I have, uh, I have managed to maintain my commissions, although they were all postponed for 21 and 22, um, uh, uh, I am using this extra time to, uh, to uh, for example, I took uh, up painting again, which is wonderful. Um, nevertheless, I hope that this uh, strange situation will come to an end soon. So it's basically it. Uh, uh, in I probably exceeded five minutes sorry thank you for your time <laughs> thank you so much Lila. that was excellent um uh we can move to well we can move to poland via the uk with um an incredible theater and opera director is helena still there on her mobile am i unmuted yes yes you are okay okay i mean in in UK it's been really disastrous and uh, theatre was left till the end. You know, it looked like there was not going to be any help at all. Let me start from what I know of what's happening in Poland, simply because I I've got many friends and also I I was supposed to be doing something now and the theatre is not opening. Uh, the particular theatre where I was supposed to be uh, directing decided not to open for for a while not until you know uh, uh, autumn of 21 because of because they tried and they found, i mean there were no restrictions as yet only the, the physical distancing but the, the, the audience was so um, apparently it was just unreliable you know they, it wasn't worth putting it putting things on um, and I don't, uh, I mean, they've got, I don't know what the, their budgets are and if they were, if they, I don't think they were given any help by the government, the theatres, like, unlike here where eventually a good uh, work of money came to help theatres to reopen, which they haven't yet. Anyway, what I find in, interesting in Poland is that, um, that there's more, you know, there, there's more happening in the streets, you know, probably not in Estonia, but in Poland, there is a lot happening in the streets and a, a lot of events and women protests, etc., which are more exciting than what theater could do in order to draw the audience. So I understand that the commercial, the few, com not many, but a few commercial theaters are open, but um, of course, with all the distancing, uh, et cetera, but, but the, 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 the mainstream theaters are not open at all. Um, and just watching from the beginning of, uh, you know, for, for the past few months, actors themselves did a lot of um, you know, presentations on, on Facebook and poetry, et cetera. So there was a lot of creative, uh, kind of substitution to substitutes to theater, but I didn't notice any interesting new developments, you know. I mean, I, they probably are because they are very creative and and lively, uh, and they're probably, and, and there was an attempt from what I heard, you know, everything is much more political, everything is much more politicized there. Theater has always been much more political than it is anywhere else, always. And um, right now, because there is a big rift between the government and uh, the, the arts, political rift, they are on two sides. From the very beginning, this particular government, which is a very right-wing government, there has been a, a huge 
rift between the arts uh, and between that um, um, be between that government. You probably know about it. So uh, I don't want to go into politics, but actually, what's been happening, as I said, in the streets is is much more much more colorful and exciting. For instance. And, I, and we could see it reflected on, uh, on, on the line, you know, the protests, women protests, they organize things um, that looked like theater, you know, they look like street theater, really. So, um, I, and, I, and I also know about uh, a theater company in Wrocław, which is um, a, a big city in the west of Poland, uh, which a theater that went underground because of the changes imposed by the government and they went they virtually created a version of that theater underground and i see on internet that they have been actually making a lot of digital theater and a combination of kind of uh, phys uh, physical visual theater and digital so that probably is quite interesting i just didn't see it um, I just didn't see it, so I, I didn't see the actual result. Um, um, I also I also observed that uh, they, most of the mainstream theaters for something like first four months or so had a lot of material to show online because many of their shows were quite well recorded. So they've been putting out, uh, uh, streaming quite a lot of, their own shows, you know, previous productions that um, are very, very good productions, which one could watch streamed online. So that's what I know happens in Poland, you know, as I said, I mean, I get a, I get a magazine from Poland. I don't know if you know about, there's a wonderful magazine monthly called Dialogue, which is Dialogue. And, and it reflects both what happens actually in the theater, but also how it reflects on the on the conversation, on the dialogue, uh, generally, you know, about tolerance and about inclusion, etc. And I find that the political one is more exciting, still more exciting than the problems that arose to do with the pandemic. With the pandemic, uh, so that's as far as I can observe Poland. You know, uh, they were, they're very quick to pick up on everything that happens. Uh, th that magazine also publishes new plays. And that is always an indication to me where the theater is responding, how the theater is responding. And I'm speaking as a theater director, as somebody who is continually looking for new material. And also, if there is a sign of a new theater language developed anywhere, then that, that would also interest me. But even though there is much talk about, uh, you know, theater changing, becoming digital or something like this, uh, I don't really see that it, that it is happening a great deal, and the reason why I, I, when you suggested it to me that I join, I joined it because I hope I am going to learn from exactly. you what, what is happening. Um, I, I, I think you know people say theatre will change, it will be different, etc. Um, I've got some views on that, but they're probably quite. You probably share them anyway, but the situation in England is that after something like four months of begging and crying and despairing, uh, the government came up with, uh, I think, two and a half billion or something like this, which is quite a lot for them because this government doesn't really see arts as a very important. Uh, oh well, no, no, they see the. They, they had to be persuaded that it's actually good business, you know. So they came up with some money which went a little way towards helping some theatre buildings to be maintained, but it doesn't help the actors. Um, and it did not result with any work being created. Uh, only commercial theatres have been doing some work and it was only recent and minimal, yeah, like talking heads, you know, like one-man shows at the Bridge Theatre, or a little half-hearted attempts at the National of doing again one-man shows. Uh, really, they were only worried about, mainly worried about uh, keeping the building going because, you know, they had to close buildings. Several theatres will die. 
uh, will not return. And in any way, as those that live here know, you know, the theater is in a very dire straits. Uh, the, the only theater that, um, uh, that has a chance and started planning and is doing anything is theater, open air theater, because they feel more confident that not only that, that they, they can do some business, but that the audience will be inclined to come. So the Globe Theatre, the Shakespeare Globe Theatre, is planning a season starting now. You know, I'm doing something there in April and May, and then it will go. So they plan the season, uh, you know, of Shakespeare's plays, and they've been given extra money, more money than other theatres. Maybe because Boris Johnson heard about the theatre, I don't know if they ever go at all. And um, and also because it's Shakespeare and it's the place, you know, where Shakespeare apparently, you know, <laughs> this is the actual, the actual Shakespeare's theatre. And, um, and also because it's sort of educational, you know, schools will come. Uh, so because schools are still working, there is a chance that that season will take place. So I'm at the moment you know, involved in casting and and planning and securing um, securing the collaborators and also coming up with ideas of what will happen when 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 we have to close the show for some reason. You know, what ideas, etc. But I'm very interested. For instance, I have so far uh, tried to resist. The, the major um, restrictions imposed on actors. That's why it interests me what, uh, what Lilia has been saying about, uh, about acting, you know, how actors are required to act, you know, uh, how will it affect performance? Because I can't see how you can do um, shake fights, for instance, in Shakespeare or anything, you know, King Lear coming with Cordelia on stage what, how, you know, without without breaking the distancing rules. But the hope is that perhaps by, uh, my hope is that by the time we open, there will already be the vaccinations or something like this. Um, that we, the only restrictions that we were, oh, that really I understand we have to follow, but I hope we will resist and maybe it will change, is that um, they hope not to, they, the, the board said that they must, or the, whoever it is, that, 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 the, that the play must, the performance must have no interval, so the audience don't crowd to the toilet or to the bar, uh, because, you know, the, the, the traffic of the audience has got to be regulated, um, and, uh, and that, therefore, the show cannot be longer than one, one hour and a half, and I simply don't see how you can do King Lear in one hour and a half, so I'm just, I'm just hoping that it will, it, it will change. But uh, may I add, you know, and this is again, maybe somebody else coming from here will have more, um, more to say on the subject, that I understand that there are several um, clever ideas of, of, on digital theater that have been attempted. And I, of, of the ones that I heard that were successful were, the always lively Belarus theater, which is a Belarusian theater, which has been given a shelter here in at the Young Vic, and they've been creating work that is a combination of political kind of film uh, reportage with digital work. And then there has been something that um, sounds like a, like an interesting new development, um, whereby. You can download the dialogue and then you can watch watch them in the street. And it's something called Contact. I think it's a French company that keeps coming to to London occasionally. And I heard something else about a, a, a program done by two people, which is called, that particular program is on, online and one can download it and it's called User Unavailable or something like this. I don't know if anybody heard about it. But I just think that all those attempts at creating, because people say theater will change, will have to change. My hope is that 
it, it will return to normal after a while, but maybe the audience will not be rushing to see everything simply because theatre has got to recognize what makes it really important to the public. So what I have been talking about, the experience of the Polish theater tells us that if more important theater is happening in the street, then people will go in the street and they will wear masks, but they will ignore the distancing, you know, because, uh, because it's exciting and we need a communal experience. We cannot be watching things on screens alone. Um, I will, so I feel that theater will come back, but probably, more in the open air. For instance, Arcola Theatre, which Lilia knows from having worked there, is building a space, an open air theatre, building a version of itself in a space not far where they used to have the tent. Uh, so I think that there will be more open air theatre and a theatre perhaps will need to become a little bit more vital and a, bit, a little bit more about, uh, about things that really matter to to people, and it doesn't mean political or topical, but an experience that is really shared by the audience, you know, not something that is just observed, because I think we're a little bit sick of observing and being unable to uh, participate or have any influence on what's happening. So that's my Helen, I will need to stop you there because I'm, I'm just quite aware some people um, need to go because we can pick that up in, in, in the discussion after the presentations as well. It will be really helpful so others can join up. Is Abby and Eloise okay if Paris just jumps in from Cyprus to make his presentation um, because he needs to... Lovely. yeah spring from school I think or something like that so um so yeah is that okay absolutely yeah thank you so much you. uh so Paris do you want to jump in yes thank you thank you Mayu thank you for uh, inviting us to this uh gathering uh well um the experience in Cyprus as we speak we are in a partial lockdown uh, which means that um two of the four cities here are in lockdown. And that means everything has to shut down by eight o'clock. Theatres have been shut down. Today we were going to do a reading in one of the big theatres in Limassol and it got cancelled. It was the result of a one-year workshop for uh, a new writing, new secret writing, so it got cancelled. Um, it's pretty much similar to what's uh, happening in Greece in Cyprus. We've been in a lockdown from March until uh, May, and then we had a pretty good summer in, a, in, 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 the, in the fact that we didn't have any, uh, a lot of restrictions. However, we had um, big cancellations of um, two, in, two international festivals in Cyprus, the International Festival of Ancient Greek Drama got cancelled, and another one of the big festival here, theater and music and dance got cancelled too. So, um, and I agree that with the, uh, Helena, uh, that the government here is not supporting artists and is trying to support buildings or to appear, uh, to appear that it supports the art, but um, honestly they don't, uh, they don't, they don't care. And there was a, a big plus of this crisis. The fact, the fact that the artists in Cyprus for the first time got together and they demanded to be recognized as, a, you know, as workers. And uh, it ended up in the government, actually, there were some protests for the first time, artists went out in the streets and demanded to be treated as a, you know, regular human beings and workers actually. And we demanded to be recognized as a, you know, in Cyprus to be a very conservative uh, society. So people in the art are regarded as people that are hobbyists, you know, that they, you know, it's, a, it's, it's more of a hobby rather than a profession. Um, so, in the end, the government gave something just for us to shut up, and it was very degrading, actually, because they decided to give 900 free months 
which means you know 300 euros. It's um, but the, the good thing the good thing is that we are, we we are starting to support each other in a way on the on the working front. Let's say now on the artistic front, there was a there is a willingness to you know from the big theaters, the national theater in Cyprus and other big venues to keep up the appearance of doing work, just to keep the buildings open. Uh, and, you know, some people are employed in these theaters, but the majority of the artistic workforce are now unemployed. Um, the subsidized theater, they are trying, the, the smaller venues are trying to keep up, but I think it's, um, it's a bit of a grim reality. And the fact is that if in the UK, Boris Johnson doesn't, you know, if he appears not, not to care about theatre here in Cyprus, it's, um, I think it's even, even worse than the UK. Um, but I think it's a time for, uh, I believe, I hope at least, a time for a social change in recognizing artists and theater as vital, uh, as vital in a society. So I think that's the biggest challenge in Cyprus, actually, to take, a way, take advantage of the situation, we can say that, to imagine people that we're present. Now I, I agree that we have, to, we have to convince people to come back to the theater. So, um, the situation now, as we speak, is that um, in two cities we have closed theatres, everything is shut down. And in the capital, only in Nicosia, theatres are working at a 50% capacity. But um, the smaller venues, they can't afford to keep, uh, to keep their stages open. So, uh, it's a, there's, a, there's a big pause in, in theatre production in Cyprus. Um, and I'm not seeing many digital attempts from uh, local companies um, for the moment because uh, I think everyone is hoping that this will, uh, this will end, this will finish and we will go back to normal. But I'm not, I'm not sure of, uh, if that will happen soon enough uh, and you know, the future will tell. The good thing, just to wrap it up, the good thing is that, as I, as I said before, here in Cyprus, for the first time, artists got together, they got organized, and I think it's one of the first times in the history of the country that actually they demanded something concrete, and they got something back, even though it was small, but they stated, we stated our presence, I think for the first time in the history of this country. Thank you, thank you, Maria. thank you all. Thank you so much, guys. Um, so, um, jumping into Portugal, and then um, we're gonna, it's up to you guys if, um, it depends on timings, if Luis wants to go first, and um, also Thomas has jumped in from Geneva uh, with his multi-country hopping. Um, so, um, yeah, um, so if we can, yeah. uh, Luis and, and, and okay. Thomas, uh, as I'm quite aware they need, to both go. Um, okay, so. so thank you, Mayu, um, for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here. So I, I wrote some words um, and I will share with you the situation in, in Portugal. Okay, here we, here we go. I call it Theatre in Portugal Surviving Under Lockdown. In Portugal, when a good student says he wants to work in the theatre, most of his teachers may advise him to think twice. Are you ready for a life of adversity? Portugal is a small country with 10 million people that still lack a critical mass of audience for culture activities with poor investment in cultural ed education and cultural activities with no social support or benefits for the artists. So working in performing arts has always been very difficult. 
There are two national theaters with their permanent casts and public funding, but the large majority of professionals in the area depending, depend on being selected and hired for shows that can only get public funding after winning applications with the government. Ticket revenue is not enough, and therefore many actors become the producers of their own shows or have side jobs to be able to survive. These professions are precarious, highly competitive, and underpaid. Artistic work um, in my country is a challenge, with the sector trying to adapt itself to survive, especially in every economic crisis. The pandemic situation has probably been the worst crisis we ever faced. It. COVID-19, the final blow. In March 2020, all cultural activities stopped. All venues, including theaters and rehearsal rooms, dance and cinema studios and concert halls were closed. Almost all professionals had their careers interrupted. Precariousness and poor labor conditions that had always been there now became more evident when the country realized that most of the people with cultural activity could not even pay next month's month rent or the bills. The sector tried to react. At first, several artists and companies decided to live stream their work or upload some shows online. This made it easier for the general public to get access to cultural products and gave visibility to some artists, but no significant financial revenue came out of that. Then, in May, an artist movement was started. They call it United for the Present and the Future of Culture in Portugal. Several other initiatives took place. In June, independent private theater companies tried to reopen, respecting physical distancing, but with the limitation of places. The revenue was still poor. A financial emergency support line for artists and companies work was created by the Ministry of Culture. This was not enough because due to the, to the precarious situation, the large majority of the sector, they were actually unable to apply for this fund and the need to provide direct food support emerged. Therefore, an emergency, uh, emergency service to give food to the, artists, to the artists had to be created. Since then, the national theater companies reopened their doors, respecting physical distancing between, between audience seats, and many private companies have done the same, but under very difficult circumstances. The country has been under a partial lockdown, especially on weekends, when the public is more prone to go to the theater. The organization of the Almada Theater Festival, one of the most significant theater festivals in Portugal, managed to adapt in the 2020 edition, respecting physical distancing among the audience, and it shows have more sessions so that more people could physically attend. The FIFA Festival of Puppet and Animated Forms Theatre also took place. The companies are trying to adapt to this new normal, but the situation is still very difficult, close to desperation and the numbers prove it. An inquiry was made by SENA STE, the Union for Workers in Theatre, Performing Arts and Music, and the conclusions of this impact of the pandemic are overwhelming. 98% of artists' work was cancelled. 75% of the workers lost at least 
four months of work, so no salaries. Regarding the possibility of starting work again, 15% will do it in December, 10% in March, and uh, 10 and another 10% expect to start over only in June 2021. Moving on, what can be done to make sure that working in the area doesn't mean a permanent drama? The artistic unions and currently negotiation with the Ministry of Culture for creating a true socially and health emergency fund that can be used to um, incentivize the production, diffusion and creation of cultural products, namely by making sure that at least 1% of the state budget is destined for cultural, cultural initiatives, and by turning precarious work relations in permanent work contracts. This fund should be used not only to provide answers to the problems raised by the pandemic, but also to give the artists social protection, which now doesn't exist. COVID-19 has brought to light the multiply difficulties of art sector face in Portugal. If there is one good thing that came out of this, it's the collective conscientiousness among the artists and the public of the need for collect collective organization, more national, national and international so solidarity between artists and the uh, urge to demand to the politician and the government to create a real cultural policy that provides entertainment and education, education for the, to the public, but also dignifying salaries and contracts, social protection and real economic support for the arts and the artists. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was quite <laughs> precise. <laughs> um, uh, moving on to multi country hopper. So originally from Belgium, but now set in Rio, but actually calling us from Geneva is um, Thomas just hopped in to speak. So Thomas, are you there to un unmute yourself and join us? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's that's a, a good start. Um, hi, everybody, and thank you, Mayu, for the invitation. I think it's really important that we have this sort of talk between uh, colleagues, um, even if they come from different disciplines, um, from different corners of the world. Unfortunately, I have to be a bit short, because as I told you, um, under the COVID restrictions we are here now, we're in, in uh, Geneva. Uh, things change all the time. So all of a sudden, we have a very busy schedule for this afternoon. So I'm, I just sneaked out of um, rehearsal. And I hope that they don't find me here in the dressing room, but that I'll have to make it back. Um, but so quickly, um, I was thinking about reading a text, but then I figured out it was too long. Um, so I'm just going to think start from our own situation. Um, my situation is very much an in-between situation. Um, living in, in Rio de Janeiro, um, but working mainly in Europe, um, because Cristiano Jartaí, the, the theater and film director with whom I uh, work, collaborate, and live also, um, is an associated artist of uh, L'Odeon, uh, of the Saint Catherine, uh, various theaters in Paris. And now there is this uh, production that we are making here in Geneva. Um, this production is a good starting point because it's, it's uh, based on Dogville, the film by Lars von Trier. It was supposed to open the new um, Comédie de Geneva, which is very prestigious and beautiful and practical. Um, grand building, um, but because of COVID, the building is not ready. So there's no theater to open. 
it makes that we are rehearsing here, uh, but the uh, premiere is now postponed to January, uh, end of January in Paris, uh, which is also still a big question mark because uh, for the time being, there are no performances in Paris. So it could very well be that we will be one of those cases, and I don't know, uh, various of, the, of those, um, of performance that can rehearse because uh, rules for rehearsals are a bit less strict, um, but that cannot premiere. So I know, I know quite a, a few colleagues who have a, a already finished uh, theater performance in their drawer and just waiting for the occasion to pull it out and put it on a stage in front of an audience. Um, we spent most of the um, of this year in a pool in Rio de Janeiro. We had uh, foreseen a very extensive tour of, of various performances um, in Europe, in Japan, in China, um, and in the US. So all of this was canceled, of course. Um, so we decided to go back home because I was speaking about mid middle of March. Um, and then there was this new word that started to, to appear in, in the newspapers, which was confined um, or lockdown. Uh, and then we thought, well, if, if we have to do that, we better do it at home. Um, so we took the last plane literally back to Rio from Paris. And there we spent five months. The, I mean, I, I can also speak, and probably all of you, you can speak of the benefits of, of a lockdown. Of, of, uh, we also probably all learned new recipes to cook and uh, found a closer connection to uh, the behaviors of our cats and dogs and so on. Um, at the same time, it was, of course, a very violent experience because of the very particular situation in Brazil, where there's an overlap between the pandemic and in, in a political disaster, um, which are very strongly connected between the, the two things are very strongly connected in the sense that there is no official um, politics towards uh, restricting the pandemic because local governments like the city government in Rio de Janeiro and so on would take measurements, but then the federal government um, uh, impersonated by a, a president whose name I will not pronounce here, um, always undid these these uh, measurements. So there was really, literally, contrary to the situation that, that we knew from Europe, there was no system. There was nothing. So nobody knew what to do, what not to do, where to go, where not to go, uh, to wear a mask or not, um, if you could go to the beach or not. I mean, all, all these things. It was, there was, there was, so there was nothing. Uh, so most people, including us, decided to choose for the for the, like a full lockdown. That means that for five months we did not set one foot outside the house, literally. I mean, I did the one, the two feet I I put outside the house was to put the garbage in the bin in the street. But of course, that means that there are people who will pick up this bin. It also means that there are people who have to expose themselves because they are bringing the, delivering to the, the supermarket um, and so on. So you created uh, also a society of, of, of two standards where a lot of people, um, including artists that I know, uh, opted for this full lockdown and where a lot of other people had to expose themselves to, to allow these other people to, to, um, to do the lockdown. So I, I have to say that the situation for the artists was dramatic because there was no work and there's no social system whatsoever. So that means that your um, income, your revenue drops to zero yeah, for five months with a few little exceptions, people who did things online. There were uh, some institutions that um, paid a little fee to make a performance online and so on. Um, but uh, in general, I mean, people would have no money whatsoever. But on the other hand, it was an illustration how artists um, continue to belong to a middle class that can allow itself 
to protect itself in that sense. And that for the huge majority of Brazilians, this was not even an option. So I, I think I would leave it there. Um, I, I do agree with, with people who complain and um, I do agree that, that uh, uh, in cases like France and so on and other countries, arts have been uh, very unjustly um, cut out of all the exceptions and so on. So I mean the, the, the restrictions on art have been much uh, harsher than they have been in other sectors of the society. Um, but I do think that in our protests, I mean, we have to take into account the situation of many other uh, people and, and sectors that um, share with us this space that we call society. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, happy rehearsal. It's so so invigorating to know that you're going back to rehearsal, though, and not back to yes, um, yes, yes, all masked and all distanced and so on. But um, uh, yeah, that is really good. So it is absolutely. Um, Take so care. Bye. bye, bye, everybody. Um, so going to Brazil via Wales, which is quite a round trip. <laughs> is happy there. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, good. So it's good to hear the Thomas speaking. You know, because uh, different uh, different views from the same same country. So I'm I'm a Brazilian. I lived all my life in Brazil, working there. I worked a lot abroad. I'm living in Wales for probably more than a year. But I think I would like to talk a bit more about Brazil now. And in the, during the questions, the Q&A maybe comes up some uh, other things I can add about the situation here in Wales, which is similar from the UK. But I think it's good to have a view from uh, other perspectives, you know, people from abroad here, to have a perspective of the system here. I think I can add something to that. So um, I, I cannot about Brazil without talking politics. So yeah, yeah well, we have to. And so uh, we need to consider, first of all, that Brazil is like a continental country, 35 times bigger than UK, kind of. And to understand what's going on right now, I think we need to go backwards four or five years ago, when, you know, since when we've been watching the total freezing policy from the government there, since the impeachment suffered by the ex-president Dilma Rousseff, and the history, who wants to know more about that history, you could watch the film The Edge of Democracy. It was an Oscar 2019 nominated film for foreign film category. So that explains a lot what happened in the country. Uh, about the, uh, the cultural policy, there's a lot in common, as Lewis described in Portugal. The lack of infrastructure, the, the um, you know, professionals in this area, they do not survive just working in theatre, just doing that. They might have another job and do theatre as a passion, as experimental. And um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's quite similar. So I think we, we need to also um, point to this past four years, four or five years, the grown of the fair right in the world, how they became visible in, in Brazil and how damaged it is to the culture. And not only in Brazil, I would say, but in the entire world. Because for me, I've been saying that in some lives I've been, I've been running and some talks like this in Zoom rooms. We are, you know, we, we became too much obedient to what the government has telling us we cannot or we can do. And we are very obedient at the time. So if we question ourselves why some business, shops, cafes, restaurants can open, and all the theatre, and something more beyond that, you know, because it can't just be an excuse, then you can't put people in the room safety. So if you can manage in a restaurant, you should be able to manage a performance space. So I invite everybody to think about what gaps, small gaps you can find to play, perform, to carry on doing what you do. There's no, this idea of a no 
essential business is you know not acceptable what's a no essential business yeah? but going back to Brazil I think we, this is grown of the fair right is visible we have like uh, in 2018 we have a series of episodes that became more and more strained more and more pushing us to the abyss you know to the borders to the limits of what we can do or we cannot so we saw an exhibition like a care museum exhibition that been touring around Europe many countries it's been closed and censored in Brazil 2018 two years ago we saw choreographer Wagner Schwartz having been prosecuted for his performance La Bête uh, the Beast when he plays as a naked body in a gallery environment and the audience move his body as a sculpture, as a live sculpture. So, you know, it's an attempt of the censorship to arts in many, many levels. And then we saw, unfortunately, the actual president being elected in 2018. Consequently, we had, because of his actions and the much of the, they put the ideology against all artists and educators artists and educators in brazil became communists all of us you know we are <laughs> no welcoming by this new government there it's terrible you know so suddenly we had the, the national agents the film agency being closed so production film production just dropped massively and we have the national arts foundation and the minister of culture the minister of culture has been closed down became like a secretary only a little body the natural arts foundation in these two years has been disastrously driven by unexperienced and efficient people who have been chosen to act as the brazilian prison puppet you know to not facilitate to not you know not do anything because in brazil many cultural productions uh, receive financial subsides through laws and incentive programs so there are some national and municipal levels of these programs, different ones. But it basically is big companies, they pay, instead they pay the full taxes to the government, they can pay a percentage of the taxes to some cultural projects. But they need to go through a very bureaucratic system. You need to apply a project, someone need to, you know, give a stamp from the Minister of Culture to say, oh, this is a as a relevant project, go on, go to get some sponsorship from this program. Uh, so this has been closed down. All these programs has been reduced, reduced, reduced. So we've been really, really, really um, pushed to the abyss to whatever we do. And the situation never been comfortable, to be honest. You know, we had, uh, as you know, I think you know, we live in uh, Brazil, live in a military dictatorship for 20 years between 1964 to 1985 so i was grown and educated during this period swallowing the fake history and moral they wanted to push us we talk about fake news now that being always you know as a weapon in different levels we will have your books in the school full of you know the history they wanted to tell you and um, so cultural education will restore it after 1985. Cultural education has been restored, transformed into a good, good and fruitful way and developed for little over than 30 years. It's a very short time. You know, you re, rebuilt everything in 30 years. And but now we are witness this huge step back, you know. And I confess that's quite discouraging and uh, going backwards and looking towards this little hope of some possible change and starting over again, you know, after being educated in the system, spending 30 years seeing all of this being rebuilt and start getting a good impression when you're being just catapulted backwards to 30 years ago. It's really not really encouraging. But, you know, um i think i'm saying that because i think we've been in this in this uh spirit of things being difficult and of course the pandemic has brought another layer on the top 
of all of that that was going on already in the country. And yet, last year, I was um, expecting in Prague, when I was bringing the Brazilian representative for the national and student exhibition, most of the national. And I think this pressure and this lack of certainty we are living already in the country since this government has been changing hands from 2016 and now, I think that was already very much in everybody and every artist's feeling and anxiety and restlessness, how to translate the moment, how to share what was going on in our country at that point. So, and, and Funny enough, I, I took this project in Prague that was based on the body. So the type of exhibition, the national exhibition, it was the body as a space, territory, and its borders. It's like the limit within the bodies. As a body, that's just one. What can I do? How I can mediate my space? How I can interact with the other? How I can protect? The other, you know, my territory, my space. So it's quite a prenounce of this COVID-19 social distance we are having now. And so I think things were already on the surface. We just didn't see or we saw it somehow and that reflected in the way we, we translate the word, our vision of the word. So, but the beautiful thing in Brazil is that because we always have this lack of a big lack of interest from the government, to be honest. You know, we don't have benefits, we don't have, you know, um, security and employment. So we are very much, most, most of people are very abandoned. So in a situation like that, some theatre venues, mainly in Sao Paulo, where I lived, uh, they opened their doors for social work to bring people indoors to tell them how to sanitize, how to protect themselves, you know. We have a lot of homeless around the big cities in there. So theater venues, they couldn't play, they couldn't perform, and some opened their doors to work as a social body, as a social institution, to do some work that the government should do and don't, you know. So we, 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 we have this sense of social responsibility when we do theatre in Brazil. So that why is inevitable talking politics when you talk theatre about that. So I mean, despite all the situations, you know, I think there is something we are used to create and reinvent in the device and that during the diversity, you know, and something Brazilians do quite well, I think. And I said Plato, it was Plato who said that that's the necessity is the mother of invention. And yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, and my personal experience during this time is like um, during the pandemic, just to feel myself in between two words and trying to understand what's going on here in UK. And it's just completely different, you know. I moved over here because I was really tired of that situation in Brazil. I couldn't go another 30 years trying to rebuild something. And I thought, I don't hear I'm going to live somewhere. And other reasons as well, uh, personal, familiar reasons, I moved out here. But, uh, but from the practical side, just quickly, because I can drop this in the, in the chat later on some links for people who are interested to know what, what people are doing in Brazil. Uh, I was, last year, was in a, in a project that was uh, like an international cooperation project in Brazil, Germany and Japan. So we played Brazilian and Germany season and we had, uh, we would go to Japan in May, that was cancelled of course, so the project was included, was, was a pity because the idea was three actors from three different countries playing together. So the play would react completely different in each country, depending on the, the local culture. And it was adapted a little bit for local uh, environment. So it was a pity not seeing the completude of the project. It seems like an abort project because it seems to be like in the three countries. Um, and in Brazil, right now, I'm, I'm doing some stuff online because that's 
and the beautiful thing, you know. This is how I think this word that has be admired and we don't like it. Uh, I think it's the dream we had by being the teletransporter on the Star Trek from the 70s, you know. Uh, this is our teletransport facility, you know. We, we are in a different part of the world and traveling to each other somehow. And so at this moment I'm in UK, but every two weeks I'm doing, I'm organizing and hosting, moderating uh, meetings and lives. Uh, the real night to directors, scenographers, designers, set costumes, lights, and designers. So we'll be sitting designers, artists, directors in the temple. So they are talking about their experience, what they're doing, how they see this time. And that has been a very beautiful thing because uh, most people see that in a very positive way. What we've been talking is that no matter what we do, we need to keep doing something. No matter how we call, it's an online theatre, visual theatre, doesn't matter. That's how we can do it now. So I think that, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, this formative space being transformed, blurred, blended in the boundaries between the internet space and the public space. We've never been so exposed, we've never exposed so much our internet space. And that's for British people, for UK people, it's quite a thing. You share your intimate space. Who wants to know more about Brazil particularly? Because, yeah, there was a lot to go. We have the event that I will be with Mayu on 28th of November, organised by the Apps in Porto. So, yeah, who wants to join us to know more about? You can uh, go then 28th of November. Louise can give us some uh, lines about on the chat, okay? Any helpful links in general, if everybody can pop them in and I will gather them afterwards and, and repost them. So that would be really helpful. Cool. Um, so, and it's quite interesting in, in this Zoom compared to last week's, there's lots of dual people. Like Helena was like, she's in, she's in the UK, but she's talked about Poland and Thomas like split in, in many countries. Abby the same. And I think it's quite nice to, fly to Mexico, <laughs> um, and Louise knows what I mean, but like, yeah, she's um, as much Croatian as well. So um, the duality continues. <laughs> yes, although I, I haven't been in Croatia, or worked in Croatia for a few years now. So, but you know, it's interesting, as you said, you know, we're all from such different places, but when, you know, Abby was talking, some of the things she said and experienced in Brazil, I mean, she could have been talking about Mexico really as well. And so, yes, absolutely. So I think it's, you know, one of the nice things about these kinds of talks and gatherings is also to just see that you're not alone and that we're all experiencing this together. And, uh, and it's kind of strangely comforting. Um, so yeah, I'm in Mexico City and one of the things I really usually love about Mexico City is that it has an incredibly lively and diverse cultural life. And having said that, the situation even before you know, the COVID pandemic was quite complicated for the arts in Mexico because uh, like in Brazil, our government, although we have like in Brazil, a left-wing government, still the funding for the arts has been significantly cut in this government. And so I think that it was already a very complicated situation. And most uh, of my colleagues in theater in Mexico are freelance. There's basically just one company in Mexico that has a stable ensemble and most of ours are just freelancers. There's no such thing as, for example, I know there's in the UK like resident designers and you know we've never heard of anything like that. Most of us are freelancers and most of us don't have even health insurance uh, unless you kind of you know pay for it yourself. So, so it's been incredibly challenging because this already you know began in a very challenging uh, financial situation for the arts in Mexico and for theatre especially. So, so it has been very difficult. Um, the theatres, you know, had to close in Mexico on the 15th of uh, March and they started reopening in, uh, at the beginning of September. But, you know, it's been a very, very slow process and they can reopen only with 30% of capacity. And, you know, for most theatres that's, you know, and especially for any independent spaces, that's really not enough to, you know, get back their, um, their uh, investment. 
and uh, unfortunately at least three spaces for, for performing arts have permanently closed during this time and unfortunately I'm also kind of sure that it's not going to be the, the last of it. Uh, I'm sure you know some others will uh, will follow but having said that there's been a huge surge of uh, you know like some others haven't um, mentioned uh, of internet and Zoom projects, theater projects. But like, you know, like Lydia said, I, I felt very identified. I myself feel very much the, the, the need also to share the same space and uh, air <laughs> with, with the performance. And, you know, it's, but I, st I nevertheless, I still feel that, you know, it's a, it's still a way of saying uh, we're still here and keeping creative and, learning things that we can hopefully you know apply and uh, even in live performances so and it's been incredibly lively i do think that it's something that has been even more lively than in other places and by the way i i saw little heart there's a theater director ali Bayina from mexico joining us here in the audience she, she did a wonderful play on zoom as well and we have some other colleagues from mexico sarah salamon and sol kellen so they might you know be able to tell you a bit more about what's also in the Q and I section about what's going on in Mexico and how you know they have experienced it. What I wanted to share is something kind of some thoughts, uh, you know, more personal thoughts, which kind of worry me as a designer. And that's that I do see definitely that those theaters that have been reopening and those plays that are being put, um, you know, there is a huge obviously then due to these restrictions to doing monologues and you know one man shows and plays with very few actors and. Um, doing very small projects so that you keep your um, expenses at the minimum but obviously that also means that you know less people get work in theatre and I think one of the uh, first victims of this in the theatre um, hierarchy are obviously designers because <laughs> the, one of the things that they feel is oh okay we can probably do without uh, even a designer for this one so so it's been you know again even more challenging I think for the designers and my heart also really goes out to all those uh, young, uh, you know, um, people who are coming out of theater school at, at this time, and especially designers who obviously I, I do remember when I was coming out of school and you obviously wanted to have something interesting and, you know, in your portfolio and be able to, you know, design and show a space. And now suddenly you're not only facing the challenges that already exist for anyone, any young designers coming out of school, but you're facing a situation where producers and theaters are having very limited budgets and will also want, you know, to see perhaps or give that money to someone that has more experience. So, you know, I do feel very much for, for, for the, the guys that are coming out of school now. Having said that, I do feel myself personally that, you know, this is the first time I've been working in theater for over 20 years. And this is the first time in, I, I actually haven't done a play in a year. And this is because when the pandemic started, I was working on a film. I had slowly kind of <clears throat> moved on to working more in film. And I was working on a film and now just this month, I kind of realized that it's been a year since I've worked in the theater. And this has never happened to me since I've been pretty much an adult because I started working in theater when I was like 14 or 15. And I've never stopped. It was basically in one way or another, one project after, after another. And this is like a huge change in my life and I don't even understand what is happening. And it's interesting because what I feel that happened in, in, in this year is that I find that need, you know, to share, to work in a team, uh, to enjoy performing arts has really grown. And I do feel that the audience will feel that need as well. And that we will, you know, survive and thrive in the long term because I do feel that this need to you know to share this experience and to um, be part of this ritual of theater is something that you know has been inextinguished for hundreds and <laughs> thousands of years and I'm sure it will you know continue and I feel that you know this period of not being able to really en enjoy to the full and, and share will only make us hungrier for for these kinds of ex experiences uh, in, in the time to come. So, um, and I do see myself that also, you know, it came to at the point in my life where as a designer, you know, after working for 20 years, I did feel a certain fatigue. And I feel after this year, you know, this fatigue is completely gone and I'm just like, I want my next project, please let me go on the stage and design something again. 
and so I'm, and I do hope you know that will will happen soon. No, but it will be a hard. I mean, there's definitely you know they would say in Game of Thrones, winter is coming, and there's difficult months and difficult time ahead of us, and I have no doubt it will take some years to you know to really get back on the horse, but I'm I'm sure we will. And um, anyway, so that's. I'll, I'll let the floor for anyone else and um, be back about be here for the Q&A. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, Pamela should be next um, to do another duo, um, Austria from UK. Um, hello, Pamela. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. I will briefly talk about the situation in Austria. So in Austria, on the 10th of March, we entered a full lockdown and all events were cancelled. Then from mid-April, slowly we started to reopen the country again. First, small shops could reopen. And then by May, other businesses such as hairstylists and restaurants followed. However, there was little to no information really about a roadmap to reopen culture or to support the arts apart from a one-off payment to artists, which was between 500 euro and 1,000 euro. And um, this sparked criticism on our culture minister, Ulrike Lunacek. Artists started to plan protests with the aim to get, get a fair support, basically. And, um, and also, we really wanted to put, um, to put the reopening of arts and culture on the agenda. Then on 15th May, under growing pressure, our culture minister had to resign. And we got a new culture minister, which, um, who announced quick support for artists and also who vowed to improve communication between the artists and to find, um, to find ways to work together on bringing, bringing live theater back. So this did, this did lead to some kind of slow improvement of the situation. And on 29th of May, our culture minister announced that um, that events with up to 100 people in the audience will be possible. Just this announcement came quite as a surprise to um, most venues and uh, venues just were not prepared to reopen with almost zero notice. And also we didn't have much clarification on how and when rehearsals could take place. So basically we suddenly faced the 29th of May and um, Venues were just not really ready, which also sparked further criticism that the, the government doesn't really understand what it means to mount a show. And venue manager said, it's not like theater, it's not like a light switch, you can just switch on and suddenly we are ready to go again. It just doesn't work like this. The slightly good news were we got more financial support for freelance artists and we could apply for a one of support of up to 6,000 euro which was um, for those artists who are in a challenged situation economically and, um, and also I think we've lost Pamela. Then in June, the COVID-19 situation slowly improved in Austria. We had fewer than 100 people in hospitals with confirmed coronavirus throughout June, July and most of August which also meant that we could uh, loosen up the restrictions a little bit for the performing arts. And um, the new rules were that with 1st of July, we could have indoor shows with up to 250 people. And 1st of August, this increased to up to 500 people. The venues had to leave one seat empty in between parties and up to four people could sit together if they wish, four people from different households this is. And, um, and masks should be used when the minimum distance of one meter could not be kept in between the parties of them, the parties who sit together. For outdoor performances, the rules were um, even less tight. We could have them for up to 500 people from 1st of July and up to 750 people from 1st of August. And this could be increased to 1,250 people if there was a safety concept which um, has been presented and approved by the council. Regarding rehearsals and the people on stage, 
we never had one rule for all. It was more like production companies were asked to develop a safety concept, which just would work for their individual requirements. These were kind of good news for some of the famous festivals in Austria. We have quite, quite large scale summer festivals, usually like Salzburg Festspiele, in case anyone has heard of them. And these, these festivals could go ahead and they were quite quick to adapt their season to like a slightly um, reduced program with reduced people on stage and in the orchestra and of course the reduced audience numbers in the auditorium. Then with September, we saw the start of the theater season under the new normal as, um, as people like to call it in Austria and venues and managers, venue managers and audiences somehow some more adapted to the situation, I would say. Most of the major venues opened in early September as usually, as they usually would, and um, they had reduced capacity and further measurements to avoid crowding inside of the venue. So then, unfortunately, since September, the cases and hospitalizations have been on the rise again in Austria. And so for several weeks now, our government tried to avoid a new lockdown and intended to use other measurements instead, such as um, using the masks in closed spaces again, and, um, and then at the later stage, restaurants had to close. So despite the number of cases rising again in autumn, there seemed to be a strong intention of not closing down businesses, businesses including theaters. Um, however, these measurements did not help to bring the numbers of infections down, and. Um, on 3rd November, theaters were asked to close the doors again until at least early December. Rehearsals are still possible. And, um, and also we got, a new, we got a new payment to support artists, which is um, 1,300 euros per freelance artist. And, and theater venues can get 80% of their trading profits as support for the time they had to close. And um, yeah, our culture minister said that this payment should make artists confident that they will be able to continue working in their field and not having to retrain. However, I think it's, um, it remains to be seen how the second lockdown really affects our industry and, um, and whether or not we can bounce back quickly. Yeah, that's um, yeah, absolutely. so great from Austria. Incredible. Thank you so much. Um, wow. Uh, okay. So, um, moving on with Leslie, um, who's been doing the unthinkable. He is been traveling, presenting <laughs> models, and right. he almost looks like he's doing something really normal. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. I'm, well, actually, I'm in quarantine in my home in Northern Ireland at the moment, but I have been doing the, the unthinkable since the end of the UK lockdown, I've been working internationally. I've been working between Italy, La Scala in Italy, between Leipzig in Germany, between St. Gallen in Switzerland, and, Bar and also in Riga with the Latvian National Opera. My life is kind of interesting and quite complex dance stroke game of chess um, because um, is unpredictable and changes all the time. Countries go into lockdown. Latvia is now in a state of emergency. Italy, um, Milan is now a red zone. Um, the UK, La England is in, where I have my studio in London, is now in lockdown and um, we're not advised not to use studios, so therefore I'm in my very fortunate to have an escape place. Um, so it's it's difficult. I, I my my route to theatres, and when I do actually get to work, is an incredible, feels like an incredible achievement. Um, and uh, the urge and need to walk into a theatre is so powerful, it's worth the struggle to do so. But I stand on the edge of the, the potential of uh, a life lived wholly in isolation. And, um, Italy, uh, immediately when you went into the country, you have a, a COVID test, you find the result the next day, you can pretty much immediately work. And um, other places, it's now become incredibly rigid. Um, amazingly, 
I'm still working with some of the companies still believe that they will open on the day that they say they will and um, somehow we'll, we'll be able to do the show. Um, with the rise of infections, which seems to be happening everywhere, apart from New Zealand, where my brother lives, where life is normal, and I speak to him nearly every day just to touch that normality. Um, and it's a very interesting thing because I, I am very much the theatrical cliche I was that we should get on and we should do a show. Um, my, my, my opinion, I have to say, in the past few weeks has changed enormously. Um, sometimes I think houses, um, and I work predominantly in opera, which is, I have to say, not the easiest art form when you're in a pandemic because of the volume of people who need to get together in, into a building. And that's been incredibly challenging for companies because sometimes opera houses are all buildings with small corridors and they're warrens of, of, of small connected spaces before you enter the actual theatre performance space. But um, I, quite often I, I found that the company wants to go ahead because of a kind of sense of pride. Look at us. Look, world, we are performing somehow we were able to do that but with that even with a kind of directive of of safety and and, and conduct and distancing um there's still what's not said is, is that people will put themselves in a room with other people and therefore be uh exposed in close proximity potentially to people with the virus and i found out with one of the companies I'm working for I did socially distanced costume fittings uh, last week and within the space of 24 hours I was in the same space with nine people who t tested positive so it's an incredibly challenging time at the beginning of the pandemic and my first cancellation which was in Basel in Switzerland and we all sat in the theatre on the day the show was cancelled and we all wept including the management at the great loss and the fear of what was to come um, now when I have jobs cancelled or postponed and there have been eight so far, I'm a bit more matter of fact. I think there's a kind of practicality. We either can do the show safely or we can't. And if we can't, we shouldn't proceed. Um, so my difficulty at the, at the moment is trying to do work that was conceived without an idea of the pandemic. I am doing a production, I was doing a production of AIDA in Switzerland. Um, which is a huge show and also very difficult. And today, the show has completely changed. We're not doing a version of our show and butchering the work and, and diluting the original idea. We've, we've completely thrown that out. And now we're doing, what can we do in this moment with this idea of this piece? And that's, not wanting to get too emotional, is incredibly uplifting and liberating because We've taken away the idea of, of, of the, the thing failing and dying. And actually, we can react a bit more. We are producing something which is about where we are in this time and in this difficult moment. And that feels really important. And to have it centered around this piece of art allows us a kind of looking into something by looking away from it. So it's, an, it's become a kind of um, a very exciting thing. We may never open it, but we, we, we will go somewhere with it. We will work on our practice. We will communicate with each other. We will find a way of being in the same space with sometimes not being in the same space. And we've taken the pressure off. So that's a kind of development today. Um, after what's been a very difficult period. I mean, I love my job and all designers are used to walking into really difficult situations, often hostile, I use the word sometimes toxic, and have to take it on the chin, be the mediators, be the people who drive the production on, be the dramaturg, be the, the sound, care, the person in the room who people gravitate to. And so we're, we're, we're tough, I think, tough but sensitive. And uh, you know, this time has been a real test of that. Do I think theatre will change? I think theatre is hungry all the time to change and develop. And um, I feel we're in a moment where that's inevitably going to come, but I can't say what it will be. But also we're in a situation where we have to personally survive 
and for a lot of people now it's very difficult but also we have to be take care of our industry and help that to survive too and um so that's why I'm, I, I, won't, I won't speak anymore. It's interesting because I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm living it now and it'll be very interesting in a, a year or just to look back and to stand on the outside and really understand the magnitude of this situation because it feels big. It feels very challenging. Um, I feel very excited. Um, I, feel, I feel the disruption is going to at the end of the day create some incredible work and incredible experiences and i absolutely do pick up on the sense of um we need collective experiences of human beings we need to communicate we need to be in the same room and we need to share the story and that's what theater does and we'll never that can't die companies will change some will go it's very sad but other things will be born and and will adapt thank you Thank you. Irene is somewhere here in the virtual world to talk to us about Italy. Um, Can you hear me? Because yep. I've, I've put my um, um, headphones on and I've got a speaker here. So is this OK? Yep, that's great. I'm very excited um, because I don't do many Zooms and I don't. Um, yeah. And this is a very interesting one. Um, the the wider um the, the 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 like after having uh heard her speak um just um our friend before i can't remember his name um his uh his um yeah his speeches was wasn't only about um a country it was more about a lot of countries and like how someone feels inside it was very interesting um but so what can I contribute um, now? So yeah, I'm a dancer, performer, choreographer. Uh, I live in England, um, but actually now I live in Italy because I've, I've moved in, um, in August for a few months. It was a, a project that I had before COVID. So it all happened in the midst of this drama. And uh, whilst I was in England uh, as a freelancer, I was a little bit scared because, um, as someone mentioned before, um, it took quite a long time for the government to say, oh, yes, we've got support for freelancers as well. And everyone was like, oh, thank God. It wasn't a lot, but um, I have to say I... I, I had to stop any activity because um, as a dancer, you, you rehearse in a room with a group of people or you travel abroad to teach and that wasn't possible at all. And English government did support me enough. Um, uh, it was a bit scary, but I think in the end, they managed to pull it off a little bit. Um, in Italy is a little bit different. I have uh, done a little bit of uh, research and um, companies and freelancers did get some money. I can't be very specific. But someone said uh, 600 euros, which is not a lot. And I do not know whether it's that per month or per the lockdown duration, which was a bit longer than a month. But um, and also they said that Italy is a little bit slow and uh, with bureaucracy, but at, but everyone was like relieved that they had something to um, hold on to, uh, which they uh, didn't expect uh, it happening. And since I moved here uh, in Italy, I can say that uh, what's different from England is that here there is a very, very good use of the a mask. Everyone has it, everyone wears it, and it, it, it's a little bit strange because it feels like, oh, if I have a mask, I can do anything. So it's a little bit strange because I, I think, well, you still have to maintain a one meter distance and and that but people would go to restaurants with a mask on and then they would take it off to eat and then put it on again and um 
whether in England, no one was wearing masks uh, at any times. I've been teaching here in Italy as well, and I've been teaching uh, uh, dance classes where all uh, the students had to be in their square. And if I if I was if I wanted to go and correct them, or you know, in dance you 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 approach the students and sometimes you touch their body as well or like gently pat them in the in the part that they need to uh, activate or it can be helpful so at that moment you 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 have to wear a mask when you when you go close and then go uh, again um, to your square and then um, take off your mask it was, it was very confusing for me because I kept on putting the mask on at the wrong time and pull it off at the wrong time, like sort of uncoordinated um, uh, being. Um, this is a little bit my experience here um, in Italy. Um, now we are in a red zone since um, a week, um, but um, as in England, schools are open. And I think that is a very important theme because if you are a parent, and if you're a freelancer, what happened in lockdown in England is, is that, of course, everyone had to stay at home, but also with the children. So there wasn't much space, uh, mental space or any space left because you, you had to manage quite a lot. And not only work, but also family life and work would just merge and... And um, it was stressful and beautiful at the same time and, and, and puzzling. I mean, everyone could probably relate to some of it. Uh, whether now um, there is another thing happening where dance schools are closed. You can't travel. Like I had to, I had a, a year of traveling planned to go to Brussels every two months to um, uh to to do work and that is not happening anymore and i cannot teach and um the only thing i can do is practice my own craft in either my bedroom or i could rent a space or i could do it in open air and that is or i can do planning and sending uh, proposals for future things or just waiting for my project to be allowed to start again uh, when things reopen. But also, this time, children are not in my house anymore. They are going into the schools. So it's a very different situation. So you, you get used to something and then, and then it's so short the amount of time to get used to something and then you get released again and then you go back, but it's not the same and it's... Um, uh, it's a it's an in interesting place to uh, be. I don't know how else to interesting is the only word that you can actually use because you could either be shit or also shit. But let's call it interesting because we're creatives. Um, um, uh, what else can I say? Yes, one thing I wanted to add. Uh, there could be another perspective on things is that uh, in April I got ill and because there weren't tests around I yet don't know whether I did um, uh, I did have COVID or not. I did do some more tests, some uh, antibody tests which also uh, were negative but however I still wasn't well and I and all the symptoms that I had and I still kind of have actually it's an interesting um, story I think I guess um, they are very similar to I don't know if you ever heard um, uh, a, um, a long COVID or a long tail COVID people that got ill and then they still have like mainly tiredness mainly that people get really tired. It's sort of like, they, they relate to this um, illness called ME, which is 
it's not really it's not really ME, but it's like more of chronic fatigue. So I've suffered a bit from that as being a dancer and a performer. It was psychologically really, really hard. So on top of everything else, and then slowly, slowly, I'm getting better and trying to pace myself and, and um, still, I still can teach, but practicing is still a little bit, uh, practicing full scale for me is, a little, is still a little um, hard. And I think I would add this to this conversation because, because, anti, because some, sometimes uh, people uh, um, let me let me say this again. Um, since the the red red zone um, in Italy started again, people got really freaked out and um, were a bit uh, desperate, saying like, "Oh, I don't really this cannot happen again." And 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 I because I haven't been well, and I might have had co have had COVID, but however I've had whatever I've had, I haven't been well, so. I think that the, pan the pandemic and the situation that the arts is in, but not only the arts, like every, every, apart from like Amazon that sends stuff around or some other like multinational, multinationals that are still rich, for almost every sector, sector is a struggle, but, um, and everyone is, is panicking as well. But I think if, I think it's really hard to remind oneself how in a good place you are if you are healthy. And uh, however difficult it can be psychologically and, and um, mon monetary and um, uh, money wise, um, uh, if you uh, haven't died from COVID, you are good. If, you, if someone in your family hasn't died, from COVID, you are good to go, and if and if you you still have some sort of a health, it, it is a good position to be. Thank you. I'll end it there. With this okay. tragic with this tragic ending. Um, two more speakers: uh, Elena from Romania and Susanna uh, from Finland. Is um, Elena? Yeah. Yeah. Hello everyone. Hi. Well, hi there. Uh, really excited to hear all the different perspectives and all the different inputs and all the different life experiences about this whole pandemic. I feel really lucky to be able to play because I have just finished uh, rehearsing for um, for a performance that was filmed and uh, is online right now. But at least three of Irene when she said that health is the most important thing. And uh, at any point, and although we rehearsed with masks, we um, filmed with masks, and it was the first time ever when we, we, we filmed it um, as if on a regular film set, like with cameras, with close-ups, with, um, we tried to make a hybrid between cinema and theater. We used a totally different, um, different um, methods of working and we used uh, techniques that are more, um, that come more from cinematography than from theater. However, it was the first time we filmed something with the actors, with the performers wearing masks all throughout the, um, uh, the shooting days. Uh, we also were wearing masks. They were at a comfortable and um, healthy distance. So every all these things that right now seem um, that one year ago, exactly one year ago, would have seemed so alien to most of us, right now are the what what other speakers said the new normal. I um, I tended to maybe grieve at the beginning of the pandemic for a couple of days, let's say the old ways. But I think grieving the old ways needs to um, take a break right now because I think it's more, more important focusing on what, what can be done now. I will choose life over art any time of day. And I think that the first moment that one of my colleagues, one of my 
uh, one of the company members will as as soon as there is even the smallest hint of putting someone in danger i don't care about art i care about that person's health uh, so this for me is like that that was my the first the first point of what i want to present about romania because there have been also in our country per pretty much everything that you guys have also brought into discussion so i know that time is running short and i don't want to say more of the same but the same problems with freelancers the same um opening up theaters closing up theaters uh pretty much everything most of the people have mentioned um the um, kind of um the struggle of getting some sort of compensations or some sort of subsidies when you're a small independent company or what do you do with the state or with the state theaters that have this large tech crews that have all these large um, numbers of people that it basically feeds and that are right now out of out of uh, occupation um so all these problems are have uh, are encountered in romania as well what makes it more specific right now is that all activity with the public is uh, ceased right now. Rehearsals can continue, as some of my of the other speakers mentioned. However, there is no um, basically theater, cinemas, and all cultural activities, indoor activities are right now put on hold. We are probably expecting some sort of. Um, um, reopening uh, next spring uh hopefully um most theaters don't uh consistently test the performers there have been some scandals regarding this as some there were some actors who were reluctant to use masks when they were rehearsing or they were reluctant to get tested because they're i'm sure they're all in all countries a faction of conspiracy theory partisans and uh, well some of them are performers statistically i mean the performing arts world is not exempt of people who will go the conspiracy theory route and that is their right however they put their colleagues in danger and um not once i have heard many stories of the disruptions of the rehearsing process now moving on to the online many um especially in the especially people who are not really new to multimedia have uh, maybe honed a bit their editing skills they have honed in um their online rehearsal <laughs> techniques and i am with you guys rehearsing on zoom is so weird and it's so uncomfortable and sometimes you just feel like uh, I don't know, like developing um, a really close relationship with your screen because it's the thing that you see the most all day. However, sometimes I had really cute surprises when I was rehearsing on Zoom to discover some things um, that would be as truthful on stage as they are online. So I think it's uh, it's what it's like uh, there's a Romanian saying, you give with one hand, but you take with the other hand. So there is some, there are some things that are inevitably lost. And I think touch is a major part of lots of performing arts, the ones that have to do with human contact. But maybe we can find and develop some alternatives to that. It's not about the substitute. I think online is, should not be a substitute for live performance because it's not it's a different medium altogether and, it, and i think it needs to be treated as as such so i think it, it is normal to feel uncomfortable it is normal and we should accept that um there is a shifting in our neural the way we perceive the creative process and it's normal sometimes to hate it and sometimes to feel as if uh something is inevitably is irretrievably lost However, I'm trying, I'm, I'm basically on the, um, on the hopeful, I try to see the hopeful side of things. I have lots of, um, I know lots of cases of small companies that despite not getting much uh, state support, despite not getting uh, massive grants from sponsors or such, have created their own online platforms 
they have tested the company members so they could film their productions and use some sort of pay-per-view platforms. I think soon we will also have online fatigue. The Zoom fatigue is a really real thing after spending five hours, seven hours, maybe you guys have also like mm -hmm. kids or relatives or maybe you, you teach online courses so that doubles the time spent online. So there is this real Zoom fatigue. But I think that if we, um, if we see it as a part of our lives that is here to stay, and not as a bubble that will magically go away because it will not. <laughs> um, I think we can start thinking of ways of adding it in our everyday creative process. For, for the people privileged enough to be able to, uh, to find an escape route, to retreat, to rethink, to recalibrate or to take up hobbies that have lost, uh, that at some point they didn't have time to do that, that is a possibility. It is also as important or maybe even more important for people whose um, who's, um, uh, everyday life and everyday um, um, income depends on that. So whether it's a new hobby or it's the only way you can have any income, um, the um, finding some alternatives online is, a, um, and I'm speaking, on behalf of many creative groups that could not do their performances on stage. So they either tried to make a short movie out of it, to animate it, to make video poems, to, um, no, they're not perfect. Some of them are pretty clumsy. I think we have yet to find a perfectly refined experience that can maybe give the same aesthetic, uh, that can have the same aesthetic value. But I, I personally don't believe anymore in a theater where uh, the audience wear masks and the people on stage magically are in some sort of parallel universe where they don't wear masks. I don't believe in that anymore in case you want to actually reflect the reality. If what you are going for is a utopia or a post-pandemic brilliant uh, future, go for it. But for the people who are trying in their performance, in their performative work to go hand in hand with what happens in society, I don't believe anymore that a performance should be more exposed than the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's mine. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Susanna, and uh, last but not least, Suski or Susanna, um, will give us like the Finnish perspective. Oh my God, I just made a pan. I didn't realize it. Um, <laughs> Wow, actually really nice to hear about things all over the world because you somehow lost, lose perspective that things are actually really different in different places. Uh, I think what one like defining characteristic of the Finnish society is efficiency. So like everybody else, we were of course shut down in mid-March and uh, the society sort of opened up in mid-June and because the uh, COVID situation never has been really really horribly bad at any moment so in the summer we actually had this period where there are only a few cases a day so we sort of functioned quite normally but because everything had been cancelled during the spring so there were not that many events during the summer which was kind of sad because Finland is a huge uh, country of summer theater, like local groups, uh, professional groups in every nook and cranny in the countryside, like every hundred kilometers, there is something going on. And now there wasn't that much of that. But even with this like relatively short shutdown, those places where you had those performances, you could see that people were so grateful to have something. So in that sense, it was quite a positive thing because at least, in, and what I hear that is everywhere else is that this theater is sort of due to all these online and the sort of media and the entertainment industry changing so much. Theater is diminishing, it's losing people, it's losing the audience. So, and in, because of that, like the Finnish theaters had already started this sort of digitization and 
sort of looking into how to make the theater more virtual. So we had already some platforms, some uh, ventures into that. And already like very early, like within the first few weeks, there was this, somebody uh, opened up this quarantine theater, which is still going on. So it's a platform where any performer can book a certain time period when they're showing their performances, they're streaming them. And they have some, some performances are something that have been touring around Finland for years. Some are specifically made now and, and things like this. And uh, currently we are open as a society, but with these social distancing measures and the theaters, they can take in 30 to 50% of the usual audience, depending on how their spaces are, because we have like this one to two meter safety zones and you have to wear the masks in the audience. But uh, in general, people do not attend live events as much because Finnish people are quite, how should I say, uh, rule following and sort of fearful in that sense. <laughs> so, but with the situation as it now, the government funded theaters are doing really well. They don't need to lay off anyone. And because they use the government funding to cover for the building rents, the spaces, they are able to, with quite small adjustments, to keep going on for now, for like this year. What happens after, nobody knows because the, how the economy is going to be affected in larger scale. And then, of course, there's this sort of horrid stress of things changing constantly because if a performer doesn't get a COVID test early enough, they have to cancel the performance if there's any like even a slight sore throat or anything. So we have really, really strict rules and we have to follow them. And of course, this sort of stress of working for something that you don't know if it's going to be performed at all, because, you know, that I guess happened to most of us. So all these sort of so different things. For that quarantine theater you just mentioned. Yeah. A link or as you can share because that's quite yeah. interesting and established. I can try and find it's in Finnish. I the whole thing, so I don't know if it they, helps you at all, but that'll be amazing. So, and then one thing I also sort of wanted to mention is this sort of we have this Helsinki festival, which is the largest culture festival in Finland. It lasts for two weeks, it's in August, late August always. And they did have it, they have to change it drastically. But what they came up with was that people could order uh, art gifts to other people. And so that there would, somebody would have a ballet performance underneath their balcony. Someone would have a contemporary circus act in their courtyard. And this was, you know, funded by the Helsinki Festival organization instead of large scale performances, which they usually have, they created these small things and it was really nice. And then they streamed them online and then they had some concerts and things and those were broadcast in the national uh, television company through them. And so there were all these, like the whole society is somehow trying to. And of course we had the same situation in the financing, especially with the freelancers, as I hear most of it, but they reacted very fast and there were government grants and then the uh, private institutions and uh, foundations that all were offering different sorts of corona grants. And right before COVID came, our government changed from uh, right wing to sort of left wing and green type of government. So one of the first things, and this was going to be done anyways, was change the unemployment regulations because the prior government, what they did was that they basically changed it so that if you were a freelancer, they looked at you as a self-employed entrepreneur so you would, wouldn't receive unemployment support and so this was like within the first few weeks this law changed so those people that had been sort of dropped out were back in the system which for freelancers was like a huge relief because they had been struggling for a few years and then all of a sudden when everything is gone if that law would have not been changed then i think the situation would have been very different here as well so, and of course the funding, I mean, it sounds like we actually are quite good off, 
it covers, a, I sort of glanced through some statistics. It covers about third of the amount of normal, like loss revenues. But in terms of how things are discussed in the media and in, in, in Facebook groups and everywhere, there is not that much noise since the spring anymore. So I, I think the system might work in a way that people are comfortable enough. And then I said these sort of online events and contemporary circus acts creating completely online performances. So there's a lot of that going on constantly here. But well, we are a very computer oriented society anyways. Great. Amazing. Um, so um, that concludes um, all the live chats of the speakers. Um, and yeah, we can open it up to conversation. Um, everybody can, if they want, um, use their cameras, unmute themselves, ask questions. Um, yeah, up to you. Um, the ground is open. Uh, hello. I um, thank you everyone for this uh, uh, travel through this uh, complicated situation. I'm Sol Kilan from Mexico, and I'm uh, I'm also in this association with uh, Lois Casan. Um, we are costume designers, and <clears throat> I I think it's super inspiring to hear you, and it opens uh, the scope of many things happening here because as you know, as, Elo as Eloise told you, um, theater condition and arts conditions here in Mexico are very, very difficult because of the situation of our government since, um, since uh, our new president was elected because he doesn't believe in arts at all. So, and adding COVID is super difficult for us, but um, hearing from your experiences and these ideas, uh, I think we can make something, I'm sure. So I was wondering if um, the, I'm sorry, uh, Susana, can you tell me please, because I'm interested in how did you well the Helsinki festival how did you manage to to do these performances in in the houses of the of the people do you test them before were you protected um i'm curious about thank you mm. i i, I if you, if you don't mind. oh sorry no. i i was just um, it's interesting that question about um, companies testing or not to test. That is the question. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I've, had, I've had nine coronavirus tests in the past three weeks. Um, I've also had coronavirus as well. Um, I've embraced the pandemic. So, but obviously, there's no guarantee that I have any uh, immunity. But um, some companies are sort of testing on a regular basis and I, I think I, th I think it's it's why I, I like the bigger companies have have more money and and able to do that but when they're putting the people who work for them in difficult situations and in situations where you close proximity to the public I think it's really advisable um, because of the fact that this virus is so infectious and has such a kind of um, interestingly, um, I had long COVID as well. I'm still recovering from it. Um, even if it doesn't, you know, we survive it, and I feel very fortunate. Um, it's something that we have to be very, very careful of. But sort of testing, as well, well as, but I, 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 I would imagine in Helsinki, I, I'd like to think they were probably very careful and very cautious. And probably it sounds like the Helsinki Festival, part of the performance was. in a courtyard or having a kind of distance but the fact that they crossed out of the theatre zone uh, uh, is the excitement and that's really exciting at this moment the, pe the fact that people have actually as someone said taken theatre to the streets um, 
and left the theatre space. But um, um, I, I, I hope, um, yeah, I hope that that the companies are careful. I think. Sorry. All right. Sorry, I think we just lost your last bit, Leslie. Like it just got cut. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I feel if you can't perform in a, in a theatre take it to the streets or do stuff outside and, and let's adapt for a while. Um, I, this thing will pass, but um, let's still make art. Just not sit on, you know, uh, and wait for the moment where we feel like we can only do art one way. Um, we can always move things on. We can always make work regardless of the money in the pot or, or, or the circumstance. Um, and that's, Festivals adapting that way is a very wonderful, wonderful thing. And I'm sure there'll be stuff that sort of will remain um, and be taken on as something they'll always do because it's sort of bringing it to people. And, um, you know, that's, it's the very sort of positive thing. I find the negative thing is when companies go, we can't adapt. That's, that's sad. But it's also what um, what you just said that um, I could personally relate to is actually saying this was concept number one um, before COVID and not try, I mean, I don't know, just sharing the same experience as you had. I think that it really didn't work when a project I had. We said, let's try and adapt it now. So it, we had this finished product with a yeah. box and everything and it started mutating. Yes. It wasn't a design anymore. It was yeah. just something I personally didn't recognize. So I think it's just that yes. go, all right, this is the new design for the COVID and, yeah. and start and have it as a starting point rather than something that jumps in um, in the middle of the project. Yeah. Definitely. It's a, I think those moments, it's a huge relief it's a huge unburdening, you know, yeah. where you sort of let go of, of that thing that you cannot hold anymore because it has no place. And to be free and sort of re restart and, um, and be in... What, what I, I found really good is you have to live in the moment much more. You can't, you can't plan <laughs> because who knows what's happening in two weeks. But you've got to... And one thing, live in that day. And that's one thing I've loved is actually, even institutions like La Scala, actually, I've never been in a building where people have been more present in that moment because actually, it's not just a presentation, it's a kind of piece of, of, of therapy, you know, for everyone and a collective experience and a, a re looking at your work. So it's, there are very positive things and, and things like this, which are really positive where everybody shares and talks is, is very useful. Very, very useful. I agree. Can I, um, you know, this is always looking for some um, examples or some other inspiring uh, possibilities for people working at this time. So, so I, do you speak Spanish, right? Yeah, so I just, um, if you uh, permit me, because I think so was looking for some possibilities, some examples of uh, how to carry on, what to do. And I was asking, so if, uh, so do you speak Spanish, right? Because you're from Mexico. You, you might be able to understand some Portuguese, I, I bet. So if you have a look on the link I posted on the chat, there's a series, this uh, lives I'm, I'm organizing, doing every two weeks to different designers, directors, they are talking about uh, what we're doing in Brazil. There are some very inspiring ideas there. I can just drop a few here because then if you have interest, you can contact me, I can send you more links. But yes, we've been, there are some designers being acting more like um, uh, art directors. So they do, uh, they do online uh, shows, but they work in collaboration with artists and actors, actresses and like designers and so on. So they, they start showing what they have in the house and they start picking objects and deciding what goes, what doesn't go. So it's like a, from distance, they work more like an art director. 
guiding the locals in their own house what to use what not to use what backgrounds you know there is another experience that's very very inspiring i think in that maybe open our hearts and our minds for the possibilities of this uh, this environment this you know this venue this online theater kind that's a company that called statues they've been working for a while already what they call uh, kind of a cyborg theater it is a kind of the theater they call cyborg theater and they've been working with technology they've been very really very friendly to technology to work um, using and abusing of virtual spaces and there's something very good they tell us because those companies in Brazil most of companies they are very they are self-sustainable they try to be self-sustainable in the circumstances they have they have only like a few seats it's like a hundred seats 150 seats it's not big theaters not big venues so it's easier for them to survive through this pandemic and also by playing online theater they've been very positive about the fact that instead the words of the people coming into their venue their venue is going to many more places so this company Saturus, they uh, produce a play that been done in brazil in the brazilian version and also they've been uh, doing two another versions one american version and another one's european african version so the the um, the, the play calls the art of facing fear will be about the new life and our fears in a zoom room during this pandemic i, I think that's a brilliant work because it expanded the brazilian territory and goes you know and i i can see if we can find the links for the english version of that that will be more accessible to everyone because they presented a couple of months ago and now they're just doing the Brazilian version. There is another two examples I can just draw quickly here is the group that has been uh, playing Volpone, they call Protocol Volpone from uh, Ben Johnson's play uh, where the audience space is a plastic unit, unit and the performance takes place in a parking area of a theater space in a theater venue in Sao Paulo. They built a big tent and there's only 20 people in audience per time, per session. What they do, they do a lot of preparation for this audience. So when the audience buy the tickets online, the production get in touch with every one of 20 people who have booked it to see this, to watch it live because uh, months ago, more or less months ago, the lockdown is in Brazil, so people are allowed to perform live performance, uh, but with all the protocols. So the, the production, they will be in touch with this 20 guests, 20 audience, and they will give a very, very right instructions what they should do since they leave the house until they get to the, the theatre. So they ask, where do you live? How you get there? What the cares you have to do? You know, how, what you have to do? What you need to bring? What you're going to expect? What you, how are you going to be treated as audience to feel safe? And that's one thing. And there's another uh, example. Some guys performing, they live in that, like um, a big um, flat complex with a lot of uh, apartments on there. And they have the sports court in the middle of that, in between the building. So they decided to use the sports court as a, as a staging area. And around the, the sports court, there is um, a fence, like a, a net, a metal net to protect balls not kicking out. So the audience stays out of the, the space with this uh, limited space by the, the net. And the performance is in the, in the, in the sports court. And, and it's amazing because you know the audience, the first audience they have are people living in the flat. Probably people who've never been to theatre before. But they are really sharing that space and experience. So I think we we are possible, you know, this for me this is the time we are in fact reveal possibilities and making transforming the theatre as we know for possible 
jumping into another uh, possibility. As, as Giorgio Agamben says, it's like uh, for us to be really contemporary, you know, contemporary by that sense you are a bit disconnected. Connected and disconnected of your own time, but looking forward to the future of something that doesn't exist yet. So I find very inspiring. I, I don't want to sit and say, oh, that's not possible, or that's, that's not theatre. I think it's, it's, it's all possible at the moment, you know. Thank you. That's, um, that's Thank really you. Scary with um, the whole pandemic, bringing theatre to the people rather than theatre go with that rather than people going to theatre and also bringing theatre to communities and engaging people that might otherwise may not be theatre goers. Um, I think it's quite an important aspect of the way it's going. I'm, I'm, it's basically what I've been thinking in the past few months. I, Helena had like a question in the beginning for Leela um, and I had to stop them and I'm really sorry. So um, did you want to go back to that? Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I had originally I had a question um, because I, I think some of what you said struck me as amazingly heroic and optimistic and positive and inspiring, truly. And I would love to know more and to take that co those conversations further. But the original question that where I where I wanted to interrupt myself and ask uh, Lilia is. I still don't know, because I've got a production ahead of me where actors will have to rehearse in a room and then go into the open. And um, and the audience has, to, uh, they have to confront the audience. And I don't know, wh what are the limitations? What happened, Lilia, to the, to the uh, instructions? What instructions did they have? How do they perform? Keeping a distance of keeping a distance of two meters, or what, or not looking at each other? No, it's uh, it's actually um, I, I explain. It's actually um, a piece of uh, instructions that uh, uh, that uh, all the actors received uh, in a big uh, company <clears throat> where my daughter works. I don't know. Uh, who is the author of these instructions? I, I'd rather put these, uh, these instructions into quotation marks because all the actors literally laughed uh, reading this because it's uh, impossible to imagine that when you are <coughs> uh, doing psychological theatre and you have for, for, for example, you have to kiss someone or embrace someone or, you know, you, you, but you have to be constantly aware of, of, of directing your breaths away from the other person. It's, it's kind so, of... Really so, so it was not put into practice. It, they were just instructions which couldn't be followed. It's, I think it's more like... Um, it's uh, like an instrument of control. How, how do you control your chaotic bodies that could cause infection? You know? and so, yeah. what, it, happen, what happens in, in England, I mean, especially with television uh, and film, uh, they, uh, actors are formed into bubbles and they stay together. The actors that have got to have intimate scenes they stay together for a period of time. They cannot contact other people, etc. So that's what happens in shows which are being rehearsed for television, especially. And film, I hear many, many private companies, people with money, take actors by private jet to New Zealand where there is no infection and they film it there. But I was interested in I saw somewhere a design, because most of you are des designers, which is very interesting, very interesting. And I was absolutely uh, 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 riveted to what Leslie has been saying about opera and would like to understand a little bit more because there was a distortion on the, I mean, or, or it didn't reach me. So if it was possible to hear a little bit more, how they stripped it down so it was still possible to do opera of some kind. I would love to hear, but I have seen on on, on internet. I've seen um, a designs uh, which included plastic um, 
screens, transparent screens, which divided actors from each other, so that actors were expected to stylize a performance in such a way that they spoke and turned, but they never actually, they were never actually breathing on, on the, maybe certain shows can be adapted to that. There, there are certain shows which could, for instance, Sartre's, I, it comes to my mind, Sartre's We Close, or there are certain shows which can be, and maybe a, a, a virtue could be found in that lack of communication, you know. There are so many plays about lack of communication. They say that all of Chekhov is about people not communicating. Maybe one could see a way of performing Chekhov where they actually are not communicating. Uh -huh. There are screens which are which the audience they don't dis they don't disturb the perception of the performance, but they separate the actors. Um, so that's one thing. I, before I, before I my, if before there is time, I'd love that for there to be time to to hear the, your answers. I just wanted to say from my experience a positive thing. I discovered that I can rehearse on on uh, Zoom. I have been rehearsing with actors and I have been running master classes and doing workshops with actors on on scenes, uh, some of them working towards a, a result, but some of them getting together and doing doing just scene work just for the for the joy and pleasure of escaping the terrible <laughs> reality. So they just fulfill their actors and I found that they were very productive that people, you can, you, you can brilliantly focus on text in a way that we sometimes we're not patient enough to focus in a rehearsal room. We can do that, you know. So uh, I, with, with certain, I, I teach as well, and with certain students we've been rehearsing for the past six months, uh, twice a week, rehearsing a play. And it has been uh, wonderfully productive. They actually found out things about acting and text that they didn't find out in a class, in a, in a, uh, you know, in a in circumstance of normal work. So that there are positive aspects, but I would love to, to hear more from Leslie about if, if there is time, is there Mario to, what is it that, of because course. I mean, sorry, how yes, did they have, of course, yeah. The question, my question to um, Leslie. Yeah, I'm in it. Yeah. How did you strip? You said that the, yeah. you had to strip everything and then you arrived at yeah, what? So um, we're in the process of finding that out. Um, we were supposed to start rehearsing at the beginning of December and now we're just going to rehearse for, instead of five weeks, we're going to rehearse for three. And but, we have to read what's allowed. So the rules on social distancing um, and where people can be in the space and, and the audience. Um, and, and it's because it, it, the situation in Switzerland, because of the pandemic um, getting worse, and you also have no, like local laws, which are the cantons, and then you have the federal law. Um, so rather than decide to stop and, and throw the production, you know, throw the team away and the people who will be performing, um, we're sort of exploring and because my director as well is very willing to use to see what we can do in this circumstance um, with very very strict rules and actually it's kind of it's, it feels personally quite because this situation is not going to last forever it will change um, at some point we hope um, sooner rather than later but just to actually just to um, see what we can do and explore um, a, a piece like Aida within that circumstance. And, and, you know, we talked this morning, the director and I, we sort of had a meeting at seven o'clock in the morning, both very tired, but the good thing was there were no barriers and we talked very openly about what we could do. And it was actually quite surprising. We didn't have very much anxiety about what we'd lost. It just felt like a sort of, we could breathe again because we weren't trying to do a big scale production with too many people on stage, too many people in the orchestra. And just to sort of, um, you know, you get these skills as you go through life as an artist and like bloody well use them, you know, sort of, um, and live in the moment, as I said, live in the moment, sort of. So I feel quite excited. Um, 
and also the theatre is very aware that we may never perform the the, the rules may change and and we may be prevented for that but we can exp at least we can explore the work with a level of support and, and the company itself feels much more invested when we were trying to do the big production of Aida I could see the costume department like mm, like this is going to happen I could feel there was a sort of how do we get through this rather than the how do we invest and I feel like everyone's um, part of this exploration now so that is that it, it is a positive positive and and you know life is what it is and it's short so uh you know let's make something of every moment and and it feels very very good um, i'm sure there'll be frustrations along the way but that's inevitable no matter what you're doing so it's good i i feel happier today than i have for for a while but then but then perhaps I mean, seeing that uh, uh, that you feel liberated to be to be free again to re to explore the process and see what can be done yeah. when nothing can be done, maybe that in itself yeah. is liberating. But can yes. you see a but can you see an end result? No, not yet. Can you see an end result of such a? I don't know what it will be. You don't know, <laughs> but I think I you don't are, know what it will be. But actually, I think you are like a soldier. You are like a veteran soldier, having been tested nine times and having been sick twice, and now yeah. suffering from long COVID. You should be, you should be made into a hero of this particular period. I think. <laughs> I I also I also wow. have a feeling, a kind of impulse, um, um, Mayo, to suggest to thank you for this and suggest that we form a union of artists because th that seems to be a shared experience that apart from opera which uh, governments respect opera because they think it's prestigious you know uh, they they don't respect artists but they expect, they respect the business of opera because they think it's prestigious but i think otherwise uh, we should form a, a some sort of international global organization free without any, uh, you know, I don't know, obligations, but where, where uh, just supporting the, how important is art to, to be able to speak to governments, because that seems to be a shared experience everywhere, to speak to governments about, about something we have learned more during this period than during any other period, how important is art as a sort of glue that binds the, the fabric of society? Because people would have gone mad without art during those nine months of, uh, they would have gone mad without, if they did not have um, uh, visual arts to, to entertain their eye. And of course, obviously they need theater as a communal experience, so that's another matter. But but I think simply the idea that arts shouldn't be the softest option for for government, you know, when they think whom to support, how to save the economy. They should not neglect art. Uh, and I think in that way, if something could be formed out of those meetings, up over and over and beyond the, the pleasure and the, ex the you know, what we can learn from each other, and share the experience as we go through it, as you are going through it, and all of us. Uh, I think maybe that there is something to it. What do you say to form something that is like an association, free international art association of artists against the government, <laughs> against the government's lazy, lazy attitude, uh, uh, limited and, and restricted, isn't it? Because how else can we? We, we know, everybody knows, I mean, right now in England, I have this feeling that people are so sick of this long period of being stuck together that they are, um, not only in England, I just heard on the internet that the Danish people are uh, opposing the vaccinations together. So, so I think that people simply need to be together. We are a tribal animal and we need to share certain rituals. And one of them is the cleansing ritual of religion and of theater and of opera i think you know it is, anyway, it, this is just a, i <laughs> totally agree it's exactly what you said um uh that the artists are glue for the fabric of society and to 
other things that came from last week's Zoom. Um, one came from Rasmus, who was calling in from Sweden, who spoke about solidarity, curiosity, togetherness, and actually worrying together. And the second thing, which is very similar to yours, um, which came from Dinesh um, in India, and he said that theatre is a medicine for society. So I think that's like, now you've become a triptych with your glue um, for me of what to take away um, and to move forward, I think. It could, it could have a practical benefit as well. For instance, I like using um, Polish designers and international designers and England now uh, waving the flag of Brexit is now tightening the rights, the tightening the Home Office criteria for allowing foreign artists in, really not allowing them. And there is no way, we have no way of persuading them that there is no artist in England that couldn't do the job. But if we feel, if a director or a group of artists feel that we would like to share it because art is international, it's a language of visual arts, design is international and it's brilliantly opening out so it is no longer limited to the traditions of a particular country but that we share in Brazilian um, and Mexican arts and that we can bring artists so if there is a support, a stronger lobby, a stronger lobby fighting for it, I think it will prevent Boris Johnson tightening the Laws because I now am confronted with this. I want to bring some uh, Polish designer and a Polish composer. I would like I would bring to bring a Swedish actress who has a fantastic voice. Uh, uh, and I am I am restricted by the new new Home Office uh, criteria. Uh, so I think that to form such a inter international group of artists of theater and opera art you know, all visual artists, designers, as well as directors and actors and singers would be, would be practical as well to maintain, to maintain that and not to feel shy about demanding uh, the, 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 the status that arts should have in a society that needs to be a stronger voice of the uh, of the artists themselves, you know. I just, uh, if I may add uh, something that uh, Helena said that I, uh, my my talk was positive, and I really tried to 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 express <laughs> the good things rather than <clears throat> than the negative because uh, uh, there are problems in Estonia as well, but uh, uh, we just have to cope with everything that we get on each day. And, and so uh, it's a very tiny country and it's struggling and it's, um, but the, I, I think we have been really luxurious during, uh, during the spring and summer and, I mean, living in in this um, house in the forest, uh, um, and 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 thinking, of, oh, we didn't even need to go to the shops because uh, the food was brought in by the cars, and it's it's like living in the luxury, and you have to be grateful that uh, even if you don't have income, you know, you have some, you have to cope, and wait to just survive. Yeah. So, uh, so I am really. I, I, my, my daughter said the actress said something recently uh, in spring that uh, uh, we will once look back at uh, uh, at this uh, period, particular period, as a as a good pandemic time, you know. Uh, and I quite like it because uh, there is a lot of uh, positive aspects about, about this. Uh, despite uh, I know that people are dying and this is terrible. It's it's uh, it's terrible, but we have to somehow um, stay uh, stay positive. I don't know. Maybe it's easy for me to talk like that, but 
I think this is the only thing once we uh, we drown into the into the sea of sorrow then yeah. <laughs> it will yeah. uh, so yeah I wish everyone stayed healthy and uh, I I feel uh, together with you so even if I am here living in in a lovely house and having good time you know I'm very sorry <laughs> For people who 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 really I was really moved by 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 these talks, uh, uh, for example, for, from Portugal and from from uh, Brazil. That uh, what is uh, what are the conditions? Uh, and when I say said uh, our um, freelance artist, and I'm a freelance artist, I I, ha I didn't have income this year after my opening in January, and then that was it. So um, the minimum that uh, uh, I mean, the minimum salary, which is, uh, but uh, at least we don't pay taxes on them. So, so, um, so yeah, I can only wish uh, uh, everyone to stay well, <laughs> well, and and, and and try to. To get the the most of of uh, of every day uh, that is given, you know, it's very important and it's a very big thing. It's a gift of life. We have to try to live it, you know. <laughs> On this positive note, it was absolutely astounding. Thank you very much, all. And Thank you. Hopefully, see you next week. But yeah, uh, let's email and keep in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Leil. Bye. Bye-bye.